Uh, there you go. OK, good morning and welcome to uh, the quarterly public hearing of the uh, Minister for Children. Uh, we're uh, about to start the questioning. I'll just uh, get everyone to briefly introduce themselves. But when people speak for the first time, I'll get them to introduce themselves again. So they're certain as to who they are. I'm Deputy Robert Ward and I chair the panel. Would the panel like to start first? I'm Deputy Roland Hewlett. Uh, Deputy Trevor Poynton, whose mic seems to be off, so I'll introduce him for us. Minister, do you want to? Deputy St John, Trevor Poynton. I always get that wrong. Deputy Mike Higgins, St Helier. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Senator Sam Mezek, Minister for Children. Uh, Mark Rogers, Director General for Children, Young People, Education and Skills. Susan Devlin, Group Director, Integrated Services and Commissioning within SIPES. Mark Owens, Director of Safeguarding and Care. OK, that's good. I, th I think that's everybody who, who may speak in the meeting. Um, if we start with the questions, in first of all, uh, we've heard a lot about the Children and Families Hub that has been started. Minister, can you explain the different types of support that are being offered by the Children and Families Hub? Um, so uh, that Children and Families Hub um, serves as, uh, as what we hope will be the first point of contact for people um, who, who are wanting to get in touch with us. Um, and from there, they can access um, various different parts of the service, various different parts um, of government, and that can be um, directed to them uh, depending on what's most appropriate for their um, circumstance. Um, the largest number of uh, calls that have come through to that hub um, have resulted in purely um, words of advice uh, being offered to uh, those who've got in contact so people will um, will get in touch uh, they might be unsure about something and, and just want a few words of clarification um, which is quite understandable given um, how much information is being put out to the public and often how um, that information will change as we as we go through different stages um, of lockdown um, but then uh, if some more active support is required based on uh, what they uh, what is said um, uh, to the hub uh, that can be um, support that's facilitated through um, early help uh, and at the other end of the scale it can be um, the MASH process which um, uh, which you'll be familiar with as well um, they, they also they of course also have contact with different agencies that people can be directed to uh, that are able to provide support that that, the, that those getting in touch might not have been aware of. Um, so family nursing, uh, for example, Brighter Futures, um, another one. So um, I think that the point of it is that it can lead to um, whatever support is required and it, it's an easier way to go about securing it rather than having to run around contacting various different helplines or departments that might have existed before. OK, so you I've got a question about the communication of those services, but I think what I'll do first is just ask you a little bit more about the services that are involved in delivering that support. There seems to be quite a wide range. Um, so who are those services and who's responsible for the operational oversight of that that wide, if you like, gamut of services, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so ministerially it falls uh, within my remit um and uh operationally will sit in sipes but it will have to it, it it will tag on to other services as and when they're appropriate depending on who calls in so if somebody has a health concern um for example they'll have to go um through that um but but the <clears throat> the, the fact that it, it's now organized um and has this point that it can go through uh, just means it's easier for everyone um and when a call comes in it can be directed uh, easier to the right place rather than having to send people off say oh you've called the wrong number and have no idea what then ends up happening um, to that person whether they get the help they need or not and i think that leads us on to the communication because it's such a wide range in how are the 
how's the communicating of these services to the job general public being undertaken? Um, are you advertising as a, a generic service and then trying to sort the direction when people contact? Are you happy with that in terms of, you know, everybody ringing about everything and then you just uh, uh, allocate them accordingly? Well, I think our preference is that uh, people um, call us rather than not call us or or, so we'd rather take calls that, that turn out actually to not require much action or or, or are just a few um, words of reassurance uh, rather than have people sat at home uh, doing nothing and, and not getting in contact. And so when I've spoken publicly about um, the role of the hub and um, asking people to get in touch, um, I, I've pretty much just been open and say if you have any concerns just contact us you know the worst thing that can happen um is that um well we'll, we'll offer a, a few words and maybe have to, maybe have to sign post you to um to another agency that that's the worst thing uh, that can happen and so um we've uh, attempted insofar as is possible in this um very difficult time and when there is in many respects an information overload for uh, for the public constantly receiving um, uh, information and, and ads about this new service or, or that new support etc um, trying to just make it clear it, it's called the children and families hub if you're a family if there are children involved and you've got an issue this is the place you can come to yeah and i think that leads on to the um the uptake of the services uh, what's the uptake been like? I think it was initially quite low, wasn't it? Um, has that been improving? Um, so uh, at the start, the take up um, wasn't uh, where we wanted it to be. Uh, we could because we want people contacting and um, uh, and asking for help when they need it, so we can be reassured that we're providing for the people who we serve. Um, in a sense, that wasn't surprising, uh, not just because it's a new thing, but also uh, because um, uh, in lockdown, people's behaviour is very different. And if people are, are staying at home and, um, uh, and, and as it was in the early days, very limited in how much time they could spend outside the home, I think that probably mentally has an impact on you as well to stay in the home for, for some people, uh, possibly anyway. Um, the uptake has increased um, since then. Um, the notes I've got say that in the last um, three weeks, we've been um, averaging 96.7 contacts a week. Um, obviously, you don't get a 0.7 in a week, but um, so that that's higher than where it was beforehand. I think for the for the few weeks before that, it was um, 67 uh, contacts a week. Um, so that's that's going up, and that's a good thing. We want that to happen. Um, and um, in terms of, of a breakdown of um, why people are contacting, um, the the largest number of those who are contacting are just for general queries, um, which is fine. Uh, the next biggest group are for people who are requesting support and again that's good because that um, that front door can be uh, is the right place to then try and facilitate that support um, where it's appropriate uh, and then the, ne the next biggest group are for people with um, safeguarding concerns um, and, and again it's important that they get in touch and, and that um, a front door can operate to, to then start the um, uh, start the next steps for uh, how we would usually deal with safeguarding concerns. Uh, and it was this has been brought forward sooner than expected. Do you think you've had to compromise on any aspect of the intended operation of, of the hub in order to bring it forward sooner? Um, I, I, I sort of wouldn't look at it that way in that um, we've had a, a situation thrust upon our entire community that um, for most people um, was unexpected and, um, and, and nobody really knew what impact it was going to have, not just on the wider community, but how as a government we provide services. And so a lot of quick thinkings had to be done and, and quick action. So, you know, how we would have implemented this had the pandemic never occurred would obviously have been a very different process and perhaps things may have been 
um, different in their application. Um, but bringing it forward because of the crisis was um, the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just I, I don't feel like there's been any um, uh, mistakes or um, uh, or things that I'm not happy about how has been delivered in this. I, I think that given the difficult circumstances, the fact that we were able actually to expedite this means we're actually in a very lucky position. Um, imagine if there hadn't been any sort of um, thinking about this service beforehand, so in through the government plan, um, then we would we wouldn't have been able to do this um, anywhere near as well as we have been able to do. So, so I, I think we're in a very lucky position because of the fact it was going to happen at some point in the future. A lot of the thinking had already been had already been done. And how are you monitoring how effective it is? Because you would have had a monitoring process over a longer term impl uh, application of the new service. Is that monitoring process in place and then working at the speed at which you've had to implement? which um, obviously is a lot quicker. Um. Um, so um, all, in terms of the contacts that are coming through to us and what um, uh, and, and then keeping track of what action is taken as a result of that, that, that system has obviously had to be created to match um, what, uh, what th this new hub and, uh, and how it's working. Um, we we have uh, briefed you with our dashboard. Um, I think a few times now, showing what's coming to us and how it's being dealt with. Um, I don't know if Mark Owens wants to wants to add anything to that for how how things then get followed up. Um, Susan, do you want to pick that up? Apologies, Susan Devlin, Group Director. Um, I have seen your operational oversight of the hub. Um, we haven't got the um, monitoring perfect yet because obviously we've accelerated things. So the system we had hoped to use has not been quite ready. So we've had to do a workaround. Um, that mainly is a quantitative monitoring at the moment, although we have started to do some qualitative follow up with the team manager and um, has has done a few phone calls to um, children and families in the main families that we've known just to kind of talk to them about uh, in, in general terms what they're um, can, can I just sorry can I just say in. sorry to interrupt I know it's difficult in this format so forgive me a little bit I'm trying not to be rude um, when you say quantitative and qualitative, just for people listening, so I, the, what I see as quantitative is monitoring of the number of calls, the response yes, times, yes. the number of people who are dealt with, and the qualitative being, if you like, how well they were dealt with, which would have been an integral part of monitoring yes. of a longer term system. But perhaps that hasn't happened as much at the moment because of the speed of operation. Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair. My my apologies for uh, for for sorry. for that use of of, of jargon. That's um, far better explained than me and much more succinctly. So thank you for that. That that's, <laughs> that's exactly okay. right. So so the team manager, one of the team managers, um, who's picked the the hub up and picked up some of the triage, has been doing a few follow up calls to families to get their experiences. Um, to check that they've been satisfied that they got what they um, were looking for and, and what they needed. It's a work in progress, though, and it is in no means um, perfect, but, but that has been because of the accelerated pace of, of, of the activities that we've been involved in. OK, a, a question just to finish off, which is uh, a really key one, I think. Uh, given the historical context of children's services over a long, long time, how can you reassure people to use this facility, which sounds very positive, but who may be very wary of government in general and perhaps will need help as well? What are you doing to try and reassure that this new element of government help um, will be successful for them if it hasn't been perhaps in the past? Um, yeah, and the the lack of trust in the system is obviously something that um, that I come across uh, 
fairly often and as constituency representatives I'm sure I'm sure you do from time to time as well and mm. building up trust in the system will be something that takes a long time um, and for some people will never be able to be achieved um, and, and and sometimes for perfectly understandable reasons. Um, I hope that um, with the clear focus that there is on this um, as an issue and as an area um, that it demonstrates that the commitment um, to putting children first um, both uh, both on the civil service side and the political side um, is genuine um, and that it comes from a place um, from having learnt the lessons of the past um, and the fact that um, we've not through that throughout this crisis just sat on our hands and thought well you know not important doesn't matter people can just manage by themselves the fact that we've done the opposite um, and attempted to, to to do something and it, even though we're you know perfectly likely to make mistakes along the way or or, or not do things a, a, as well as um, we might have done with hindsight um, I hope over time um, the fact that that commitment's been made and there are um, at least some tangible actions which demonstrate that that commitment was gen was genuine and um, that people will start to feel um, that the service is not um, purely there to um, punish families for not doing the right thing it's there to help people we it, it's there to offer you help and support in the early stages of an issue you might be facing um, as your friend as something that's supportive and, and wants to um, be there for you rather than the focus purely being at the other end of the scale um, and it will take it will take a while for that to embed itself in the community's understanding um, but but when that is complete um, it will be a, a much more positive thing because of it I think um, well Roland and Mike Roland did you want to ask a question now or oh, no I mean it, it's 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 part of this really uh, and thank you. sorry and then we'll go to Mike sorry go on Roland the, ch the chairman described that it, it very well. You're bringing together a gamut of services. I, I like I like the way that was put, which is a very complicated thing to do. And um, one thing I would like to understand is: Do you have the necessary IT strategy and budget in order to ensure that you're bringing together so that you see as a, as a bigger picture service a single version or a single view of the truth? Um, is that one for Susan? Um, thank you, Minister. Um, I, I, I think it's a work in progress. We are very keen that we um, link in with the Mosaic um, IT system, what the children's service have had in use now for a couple of years. Um, there will be a separate module, if you like. Um, but what we'll have is a, a kind of on a permissions basis, people will be able who are involved with children and families to contribute to that um, case management and recording system. Um, and our practice model does um, work with teams around the child. So the team around the child will be able to progress those matters. The lead worker who acts as a coordinator will have the responsibility for pulling all the information and making sure that that's held in one place. We're not quite there yet, but that has been one of the um, <coughs> priorities for the development of Mosaic and for the development of our early help, as we describe them, services. Um, so the collaboration with um, other uh, third sector and other government bodies has been probably 18 months um, in the in the planning. So there has been a lot of collaboration where people are absolutely signed up to this, which I think did help us accelerating things. Um, so the, the Mosaic system will be the basis for the IT communication and case recording. Um, there is resource um, in the government plan to make sure that happens. Um, so we're, we're kind of pursuing that. But as I say, we're on a workaround just now, which necessitates people speaking to each other, um, and that's happening quite well. There's lots of um, teams around the child involving in children and families, even on a virtual basis, 
that is still happening just now. So there's lots of good work going on and people are um, sorting out the work around for that. So it's a work in progress. I understand work in progresses and I understand workarounds. However, in the short term, workarounds are dangerous because ultimately you're bringing together data from multiple different sources that will be inconsistent. And inconsistent data in a central location against which you're making decisions ultimately means, with through no fault of your own, by the way, you'll be given data against which you will make decisions that could be poor decisions, which could affect lives. So my question is, I understand you've got to get to the destination, but do you clearly have the destination mapped out as far as the IT strategy is concerned to ensure that nobody slips through the net and, is, and poor advice is given and poor decisions are made because of poor IT systems? Um, Minister, shall I take that? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll follow up though. Okay. Uh, certainly. Um, we do at the moment have one vulnerable child's list which is being checked on a regular basis. It's being tested and um, verified with all partner agencies. In relation to the roadmap, the roadmap is in place um, and that's been overseen by the Mosaic Programme Board, which um, Mark Ors is the director um, oversees. So we do have both um, quite a um, quite a good workaround, if I can use that term, which I don't want to to use as a, an undermining. There is a vulnerable children's list, and then and then we do have the the longer term roadmap in place. I understand the workaround and I understand you're, you, you started with some legacy systems and some silos and I really like where you're going and the direction you're going and that has to be. I'm just concerned that you're not getting the necessary to support to ensure that you get the full integrated systems at the end of the day and the difference between it is integrated systems and grabbing data from different areas and putting them into a system and that fundamental data management means poor decisions can be made. That's just what I'd like to be assured of, that you are getting the support to get to where you know. I know you want to go, you're quite clear about it. It's to make sure you're getting the support to get there because poor decisions affect the lives of, of children and, and adults that we serve. Um, that, that is, um, that, that's, that's a good point and it's true ultimately for all government departments if we're not um, if we're not working on a, a sound system that integrates well um, with other uh, departments and if um, uh, and if um, it's not invested in properly that then there can be real issues and uh, th those of us who served in the last uh, term in the states assembly um, I think were very frustrated at what we saw was the lack of progress uh, on um, uh, on eGov and, and and everything that goes with that. What I'll say is that the children's service is um, in a I, I would say a, an advantageous position in that um, we had a system before the mosaic system that was introduced um, that was uh, not as good as the current system. And certainly from my conversations with um, uh, with social workers who worked under the old system, they much prefer the new one. And th that that experience of uh, not liking a system and then moving to a, a good one means that at least from the perspective of the people we're working with, um, that they will understand the implications of not having a system that says um, uh, user friendly and uh, fit for purpose um, uh, as possible. Um, because then they will see the knock on effect that that has on the children. So, so at least we're in a department where I think the people working there understand the issue very well and, and hopefully won't be too scared to communicate that to us if they um, are seeing issues that need to be resolved. Minister, I'm just putting this into the public forum, my support that you really have got to get the support, my support to get it absolutely right. That, that's my that's what I'm actually trying to trying to convey. I understand the importance of it and I'll, I'll back down on that one and, and hand over. Thank you. Thanks. OK, um, can I just follow through on some of the things? Uh, first of all, you've mentioned about the systems you're bringing in, but a big concern which has been illustrated, I think, by Ofsted, I've raised it, other members have raised it as well, is the quality of your records. And we know that a lot of the children's records are inaccurate, the statements in them, uh, that uh, 
I've given the example in the past of a woman who was, according to her records, uh, had a child uh, in one particular year, and there was no way she had a child. There's no record of it. Uh, we've had others where defamatory statements have been made about people. What is being done to upgrade your records? Not so much the system, because it's the usual thing. If it's garbage in, you get garbage out. Mm. Um, is that? Oh, uh, Mike, I, th I think you said something with the uh, with the microphone muted at the end there. Sorry. It must have just gone. I'm just saying that basically, if your record keeping historically has been bad, what steps are you doing to correct the errors that are in there? Otherwise, the same mistakes will follow in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is that is that um, one for Mark Owens? Well, Mark can do it or whoever. Um, I just want to answer. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy. Um, it's, it is recognised uh, that the quality of recording um, hasn't been as consistent and of the high quality that it should have been in the past. Uh, we are uh, we are in the process of implementing uh, a new quality assurance framework, uh, new practice standards, um, um, a new audit. So we're able to both dip sample at random as well as able to um, look on a monthly basis at case records. Um, there is an element now in staff supervision, reflective supervision, uh, where we're looking at the, the, the relationship between what social workers think and are seeing and the way in which they're able to write that. We've got new case recording training, uh, which is about treating case records as life stories, as life histories. Um, there hasn't in the past been a sufficient kind of consideration of these records being um, things that people and when they leave care at the age of 18, um, read um, uh, with compassion and with sensitivity. Um, and too often, social workers in the past have um, cut and paste emails in, possibly cut the wrong emails into the wrong records. Um, and so there is a considerable amount of work as part of our improvement plan going into ensuring uh, much better quality assurance. We're also developing closer relationships with um, data uh, management within uh, our colleagues in health in terms of the way in which the subject access reviews work. Um, but also we recognise that there will be legacy issues where young people who are now care leavers or will be care leavers um, who will see records that are from the past. Um, and so we're also putting in place counselling services to be able to support uh, young people to access their records and come to terms with the way in which things might not be written the way they should have been. Um, but also to enable them to come to terms with the trauma that they've experienced as part of their um, history of abuse. OK, um, what are you actually are you going to involve, um, for example, uh, the parents of the children or the children themselves before they become care leavers? In other words, um, if records are there, are you going to allow them to see their records periodically so they can point out if there are errors or they disagree fundamentally with something that's been put down? Um, if I may, Minister. Uh, so in terms of, um, for example, um, case reviews and conferences uh, within the child protection process and uh, reviews of children looked after, um, after each meeting, um, then we have a responsibility to share those minutes. There are minute takers at each of these meetings um, and we um, uh, ask for um, accuracy checks against those records. Um, also, um, young people and their parents can ask um, with notice to see their records at any time. Um, and um, of course, we can then um, share them with them um, appropriately redacted. So we're not sharing third party information, which actually includes not sharing information sometimes with birth families, depending on the status of children and young people in relation to court orders. Uh, but there is no doubt, Deputy, that um, we need to check more regularly together with children and families and other users. Um, and there needs to be more transparency and accountability for the way in which we're writing about these people's lives. Oh, well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, fact, uh, can, sorry, I, but, sorry, sorry, Mike, you carry on. Sorry. Uh. Okay, yes, I was just going to go uh, following up on something Susan said earlier. And she mentioned about uh, the qualitative sort of checks, which although rudimentary, you've done some. Can you be a bit more uh, open in one sense about the nature of the feedback you had. Has it always been favourable? Have there been criticisms or what? Um, I, I, I don't have all the detail for that, uh, Deputy, so apologies for that. It's it's 
it's a starter for 10 that we've had. I think in general terms, people have been quite pleased that they've known where to contact. And I think that's because some of the communication work that's been done in particular around social media, so people have known where to contact. I think they have found it helpful. Um, they've found it helpful to be able to um, get advice during this very strange time, I think. Um, has anybody found it unhelpful? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can try and get some more information on that. It's it's early stages and it's low numbers just now, though. OK, thank okay. you. I can think I Roland had a quick question after Mike and then I've got two more and then we'll go on to Trevor. Go on, sorry, Mike. OK, just following through from, um, in fact, the chairman's comments earlier about how it's perceived by uh, the users. Um, you all know that uh, we've all experienced uh, um, Deputy Karina Alves, myself and others, uh, there are people who actually see the children's service as the enemy. And by the enemy, I mean that they see them as all they want to do is take the children away from their parents. Um, how are you going to try and counteract that perception that people have, a genuine perception? And it could be Marcos, it could be the minister, whatever. I'd just like to know how you're going to deal with this uh, perception that people have. The service isn't there to help, it's more to uh, take their children away or break them. So the, the, one of the difficulties is the fact that um, there are uh, inevitably in this line of work occasionally cases which are extremely complex and uh, often extremely upsetting um, where whether the end result is the right one or not um, getting through it and to the end of it will be a traumatic experience that uh, will often leave people uh, not feeling um, happy or satisfied irrespective of what the outcome is and that's absolutely um, understandable because of some of the um, sad reasons there, there sometimes are for people coming into um, the service and that uh, is always going to be the case no matter what the quality um, of the work being done um, is. Um, I, I go back to what I'd said um, uh, in answer to an earlier question that um, with the focus, uh, an, an increased focus now on early help and trying to help families at the um, earlier stages of issues they may be encountering to try to um, help them so that those issues don't escalate um, will hopefully eventually um, lead to a, a reduced amount of people who who hit those really really um, difficult um, uh, situations where sometimes drastic action uh, is unfortunately necessary um, so I, I think that by a, an increased amount of communication between families and the service that is at those earlier stages and is um, quite clearly uh, intentionally there to help people uh, and hopefully successful in helping them and avoiding um, those worst situations. Uh, eventually we want to be in a position where it, out there in the community people are able to say when they're speaking to other families who might have an issue, oh yeah I, I used to have that problem but I just went to the service and they helped me out with it, you should try that as well and, and end up being in a situation where people can positively and, and proactively want to encourage people to um, uh, to engage because of what it's able to offer there um, and, and a, the greater a focus that we have on that the more, more likely we're able to get to that position and, and end up with um, the reputation um, that we want to have um, but but it is sadly always going to be the case that um, no matter how hard um, we try there will sometimes be some really upsetting cases that still come our way um, which even when they're um, dealt with absolutely appropriately uh, and rightly will still leave people feeling um, very upset and, and what we have to do in those situations is put the child first and, and make sure that we meet our obligations to keep children safe um, and don't um, ever return to what has happened in the past where um, uh, quite clearly that wasn't the main motivation for, for um, some people who, who made poor decisions that people suffered the consequences from. Thank you. Roland, do you want to 
Very, very, very quickly, um, Deputy Higgins raised a really good point, and I think his mic went a bit mute when he made it, is the old IT adage or mantra, garbage in, garbage out. And so again, I'm sorry to go back a bit, but, but what specific measures or actions or projects or whatever do you have to ensure that we go through a process of cleansing and validating all the data before it ultimately gets into this critical data source that is going to be the decision tool for the for families and children and et cetera alike in this island. Um, I think I think that that has been touched upon. I don't know if Susan or, or Mark wants to add anything to that. It was touched upon, but it absolutely should be a focus. Yeah, um, just just to add that I think it's good practice when you are working with families that when. Um, anyone is contributing to an assessment and bringing an assessment together in the form of the report, that at that stage, it's good practice to talk through with the child, depending on, of course, their age and stage and level of understanding, and the parent, what you're putting in the report. And actually, in our templates now for reports, there is a section that says, um, you know, I agree or disagree that this is factually accurate or I agree or disagree with the assessment because factual accuracy is one thing. Somebody's professional assessment may be very different from someone else's opinion. So there's, it's important to differentiate those two bits, but those forms and assessments um, have a section where we can record um, quite clearly at the, at the kind of point of completing it, whether the family and the child agrees with that. So that just builds on um, the other things that Mark Ors talked about earlier in the hearing about quality assurance, good supervision, good management oversight. These are all the things um, that will go to, to ensuring that um, the, the quality is, is good and accurate. Um, that doesn't mean to say that everyone will always agree with the conclusions and the assessment, um, but it should go um, quite a distance to ensuring the quality um, and accuracy of, of the information. That's a work in progress. What about the legacy data? So so I think as, as those things be, we become aware of them, um, people need to go through that. They need to check that. And if if there is information that is inaccurate, um, there needs to be um, a note inserted in the, in the file, as is the, the data quality and practice. And certainly, um, I know that has happened within the, the service. It's kept then as part of the record to make sure the correction is clear. OK. Um Unless you want to add anything to that, I've got a couple more questions. Let's move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, um, and it does actually link to this because we talk about early intervention and early help, perhaps hopefully not leading to the sort of situations we've had in the past, which I think is good. So have you established a parenting advice line? And if you have, how many calls have you received so far? A parenting advice line, as in, how's that distinct to the Children and Families Hub line? I thought there was a, I thought there was a specific um, place for parents who may be struggling during the lockdown. Um, an advice line that was quite specific to parenting advice, uh, or is that one one part of the Family Hub? Um, well, there there are um, other agencies out there that provide um, direct support for um, uh, for families and, and parents, um, and those can be uh, w they can be directed to through the Children and Families Hub. But there are of course um, groups that that will continue to uh, promote their service independently and and accept people going directly to them. Um, uh, I mentioned before um, Brighter Futures, who, whose work is um, is well known and and continues um, uh, con continues to be uh, delivered, obviously in different ways, um, with uh, physical distancing, uh, etc. Um, family nursing um, as well uh, provides support for um, for parents and um, 
uh, and uh, pregnant women as well. Um, and that that continues in so far as it's possible um, to do so with the restrictions and when we can guide people um, to them, but people do still have the option of going directly to them if uh, if they hear about that service um, separately to us. OK, we spent quite a lot of time um, with it. We'll move on. Uh, the Deputy of St John, you have some questions to go through. Thank you. Yes, it helps to have your mic turned on. Um, yes, Trevor Poynton, Deputy St John. Um, I've got a series of questions that are um, looking at st staffing in the service um, and wondered initially what are the current staffing levels within the children's service? Sure, um, I've got some uh, numbers in front of me <coughs> uh, that I can give you. Um, we have um, uh, 36 uh, social workers, 34 able to work, eight of them unavailable for visits. 58% um, of staff are available for short break services. 75% um, of staff available in residential um, and we have 15 uh, fostering households available. Um, so uh, th there is um, uh, c capacity in there uh, to um, to help more people if that's necessary. Uh, thanks, Minister, for that. Joe. You cited that there are a number of people unavailable. Um, for what reasons are those people unavailable? Um, th there'll be a, a mix of reasons. Uh, does Mark Owens uh, want to elaborate on that? Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, they are unavailable uh, because they're shielding at home or have underlying health conditions um, or actually one of our team managers is running um, a children in need team from England um, because um, of their own circumstances. Uh, that is not to say that they're unavailable for home visits, but they're actually available for running teams, providing supervision, having daily contacts, reviewing records. Um, and so it's just a distinction that we need to have to understand how we're able to deploy staff in the community. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, moving on, how many people are actually off sick? Um, and how many are off sick as a direct result of the COVID uh, pandemic? Um, I don't have the figure to hand, but that's because it's very low. Um, whilst we have people who are more vulnerable, they're available to work. Um, and then we have had a constant uh, changing number within residential <coughs> where people have come into contact with someone who has been symptomatic. Um, they've had their seven days um, and then they've or their 14 days and then they've rolled back on. Um, so that number changes every two weeks, but it's um, it's very, very low and it's under 10. I can supply the axle figure um, after the hearing. And is the level of uh, absence through sickness uh, so small that it's not having an effect on the service or is it having an effect on the service? It's having no material effect on the service at all. That's very good to hear. Uh, so you're able to, in actual fact, deliver uh, uh, effectively a, a full service. Um, is with given the hub, uh, are you able to um, uh, offer technically more support now than perhaps you would have been doing some months ago when people were perhaps more concerned about their health, took quite a bit of time off sick? I mean, traditionally, the levels of sickness in uh, organisations is around 10, can be around 10%. <coughs> I'm, just when, what, I'm just wondering whether, in fact, the effect of this golden uh, lining is that we're getting a better service as a result of the situation we find ourselves in. <coughs> Minister, would you like me to? Uh, yeah, please. Um, it actually is the fact uh, that the service that um, I took on in November is now closer together and more unified and more willing to work for each other than at any other time before that I've known. Um, and um, nearly all staff are prepared to go that extra mile during this period because we have developed a new operating model we have actually reduced caseloads in the children's service from 600 to 450 that number has been fairly static 
Now, of course, we're not seeing the number of referrals we would hope because of lockdown and agencies not seeing children and young people in the same way. Um, but actually, whilst we have a lot of agency staff that have left the island, um, we that's about 18 agency staff. We have a smaller headcount at the moment, um, but we actually have fewer cases and we have more capacity um, to do direct work than we've had um, in quite some time, actually. So um, the short answer is uh, yes, Deputy. Um, we are actually in a better shape than we've been. Can I just ask a quick question regards staffing? That's good. Uh, perhaps it's not of the impact it may have. But do you think that if we, as we develop a regime of testing for essential workers, it would actually help you further? Um, because you'll know where your staff are and it may help with home visits because there must be some difficulty with home visits. I know Deputy Higgins wanted to ask about how many home visits have been carried out and how they take part because you'd have to have a real protection factor in there for everyone involved, wouldn't you? Um, so essentially, uh, we are following the British Association of Social Workers home visiting guidelines. Um, and I've developed our own bespoke uh, risk assessment matrix, which essentially is the three green, reds and amber. Um, greens are um, those uh, pieces of work we can do remotely. Um, amber are those uh, where we need to have um, direct contact, but direct contact could be a visit in the garden, on the doorstep, in the home, in the park, on the beach. Um, and we assess the extent to which we can do that based on need, so we need to visit them. And then on the um, vertical axis, it's risk of infection. Um, and so we um, have different ways of understanding risk of infection. So we contact them in advance. We have a set of questions about whether they've been symptomatic in the period before the visit, whether there's anyone shielding in the home, because we have a responsibility both to our staff and all people um, known to the family who we might come into contact with. Um, if we can, if we can't contact them in advance, we then have to treat them as symptomatic, and we would then don full PPE equipment both together and with our partners, such as the police. We then have a red category, um, which is where we have to do a visit, but we can't do it safely. And of course, um, where there is, a, for example, a life and death situation, where, for example, a, a, a known family might be um, symptomatic, uh, but we know the changed child to be in danger then of course we would take appropriate steps. Um, but, but that would be if PPE wasn't available, for example. So it's highly like, unlikely that that situation would occur, but our risk assessment allows for us to take that into account. Okay, thank you. Sorry, um, uh, Deputy Poynton, I interrupted you. Um, what, what, what is new, Chairman? Um, I'm going to ask uh, questions now about the um, residential homes. Um, what plans do you have in place to maintain staffing levels in the, in the residential homes um, at this time? Um, the staffing levels um, are, uh, are currently sufficient. Um, there are um, seven places that are available in uh, residential homes across um, five homes and there are bank staff that are not um, that are not currently being used who could be uh, called upon uh, and family support workers can stand in if necessary as well. Um, apologies, I can hear my phone going off uh, in the background. So I'll try and ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, so how often do you, do you review your plans in relation to staffing, uh, given the, uh, the circumstances we have and the changing external circumstances? Uh, oh, well, they're constantly being monitored and I'm being uh, updated every week about um, um, about the situation in residential homes, how many places there are and um, uh, and, and who's able to work them. Um, and that have, I think um, has has been pretty good. Um, and as, as far as I understand it, the um, feeling in those um, residential homes um, between uh, the young people who are there and the people who are working there um, is uh, pretty good by all accounts at the moment. Uh, Minister, if I may, just to follow up, um, yep. the leadership team in the Children's Service we receive um, a daily update before 8.30. Our analyst updates our daily dashboard, which um, panel members have seen in private. Um, and we have a 9.30 tasking meeting every single day 
where we review out of hours information from the police, um, our current headcount and need. Um, and uh, that is also then shared with partners. Um, it's been shared uh, with the Children's Commissioner um, and obviously um, it's part of Mark Rogers' daily dashboard for understanding the work of the whole directorate. So as staff come and go in the, these residential homes, how, uh, how are you, what are your arrangements for pre protecting the children living there uh, for, for in, in the COVID environment? Um, Minister, shall I? Yeah. Um, so we have restricted movement. Um, so we have, we're running the homes on a minimal number of staff possible and keeping those staff um, to a constant. Of course, um, they are required to um, adhere to the social distancing rules themselves um, and they uh, are um, being very clear on their own um, uh, potential um, symptoms. So um, we're being in, entirely very vigilant around that as well as the young people. Um, we are not letting people enter our residential homes in a way that we perhaps used to, including if the police are attending. Um, our um, um, missing children numbers um, have been dramatically lower during this period than at any other time. And that's because uh, young people in residential children's homes have been staying in and that's been enabling them to build relationships. Um, so there's been a lot less movement um, across the homes. Um, but of course, we run short breaks in two of our homes, which is slightly different, where we have um, uh, children, young people with quite high complex needs and health needs. For example, um, uh, having uh, tracheotomies, uh, and of course they need to be changed, and um, they you have to get very close to them, and at which times um, the full PPE equipment is available at all times, and that is undertaken under the supervision of nurses and health, health staff. Um, and those children's uh, conditions are constantly reviewed by paediatricians. Well, thank you for that, Mark. Um, so. There used to be a situation in which uh, children living in residential homes might often absent themselves. Um, certainly in my days as an honorary policeman, uh, one of the tasks would be to perhaps go searching for an individual. What is what's the level of uh, absconding now in this uh, environment? Um, you're muted, uh, Mark. Sorry, um, I will just share my screen and let you see for yourself. Uh, can you now see that bar chart? Yeah. Uh, mm, no. Um, OK, I, th I think some of you can. Yeah, oh, right. OK. So what this shows you is uh, missing from home. The week, this is the weekly updates. So as of the 18th of the 5th, you will see in April, um, there were only uh, 25 episodes and so far in May there have only been 12 um, and that actually is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine young people um, and actually for seven of those it was only missing once um, and the highest of those young people they've been missing only five times in the last 28 days and this is against an average in February, uh, sorry the number, total number in February was 90. So you've got February at 90 and you've got April at only 25. So a significant reduction, which has enabled uh, our residential staff to build relationships they could only have dreamt of before COVID. In some respects, with respect uh, to obviously the, the, the harm caused by COVID, it's actually enabling um, much more um, boundary setting and relationship building in our residential homes. Okay. Uh, I think we're having some some problems here, aren't we? Deputy points and are you um, finished your section, Mike? No, I've, I've got a couple of other things. Uh, so, so what are your main areas of concern? Uh, we've talked about staffing. Are there other issues that um, uh, you uh, that are challenging the service, uh, the residential service at this time? Um, uh, I mean, I was going to say that there is an overarching uh, concern um, 
across the whole government, which is just about people's well-being and, and the fact that um, people are, are, are sometimes working in different ways. Uh, people will um, will be feeling um, anxious and, and stressed out about everything, um, but that that's um, across um, the entire government, but something that we um, as an employer have got to be um, cognizant of and um, and respect that in our workforce if they come to us and say that they've got um, particular concerns. Um, but as, as Mark has just explained in the context of, um, of residential homes, um, we're, we're sort of paradoxically in quite a quite a good situation there where um, the working environment there probably has some advantages to it because of this and the relationships that are now um, being built up um, and the fact that there's um, capacity there as well uh, probably helps a bit too. Uh, thank, thanks for that Minister but it, it inevitably, inevitably brings us on to funding. Um, do you believe that you have sufficient funding to provide the service at this time? Um, yes, um, we, we're, we're lucky in that um, we're in um, a growth area uh, in, in that it's been recognised by the government and the assembly that uh, putting children first is a strategic priority and so extra funding that is um, begun coming our way and can and in, in the government plan as it stands is due to continue uh, coming in. So that puts us in, in an advantageous position. Um, and we, of course, had, uh, had before all of this kicked off, um, been uh, working hard on some of the growth areas we were looking at uh, and an extra service provision. Um, the, the problem, though, is that that has been disrupted because uh, of this and, and some of the energy that would have been going on um, changing the things that um, uh, we we were really keen to get moving on uh, has, has obviously been uh, disrupted. Uh, I'm, I'm not clear exactly at this point um, that the, uh, uh, the the overall scale of that disruption and and how uh, and to when certain things might end up being delayed because of that. Um, it is um, the case though that um, we're, we're um, forecasting um, at this point um, uh, Eight hundred thousand pounds operational underspend, um, but uh, one point five million slippage on growth initiatives. Um, so, so we're not, um, you know, we're, we're not uh, worried at this point about going over budget um, or anything like that. But just ha having to have a year where we're not doing what we planned, what we were going to do, uh, it just means the picture is different. And and at some point there'll have to be a um, a discussion about how um, th those projects we were we were wanting to get on with get put back on track. How long that's going to take? If if there needs to be reviews about how some of that is done, uh, I think ultimately that will end up coming to the um, next stage of the government plan, which is going to be a um, an interesting experience. Uh, I'll call it given the optimism there was at the passing of the first part of it and now, now having had everyone's um, uh, everyone's work disrupted. Um, so, so so not not in a position of worrying about overspending, um, but the general disruption uh, is obviously something to be concerned about, but was always going to be inevitable, unfortunately. Thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll pass you over to Deputy Mike Higgins. Thank you, Trevor. Um, before we do, can I just ask, uh, <coughs> can you just follow up? You mentioned about um, in extreme cases uh, in terms of home visits where you'd have to don full PPE or involve the police. How many times have you had to do that to date? Um, I'd, I'd have to give you a, a, a kind of a detailed breakdown because um, the, the way in which we consider what is donning full PPE kit in visiting with the police versus wearing just the gloves and the, the face mask or not wearing an apron uh, is, is is difficult. But in terms of uh, in terms of a child protection visit with the police, again, those numbers would be lower than um, than five, actually, in terms of it being um, a full full kit and with the police for a child protection visit. That's a very low number. OK, thank you. 
OK, moving on, uh, I want to look at the regulation of children's residential homes. And as you're aware, Jersey Cares have raised a number of concerns, especially when we were looking at the emergency legislation. Uh, can you tell me, first of all, um, what recent contact you've had with Jersey Cares? And have you also discussed these issues? Uh, me, me personally, I don't think I've spoken directly to Jersey Cares for a few uh, weeks now, but while, whilst this was a, um, a heated issue, uh, I was uh, in correspondence uh, with the head of Jersey Cares, um, and I know uh, my officers have been in contact uh, with, with them as well. Um, I know uh, Mark Owens spoke to um, Carly Glover from uh, Jersey Cares um, as, as part of this to, to offer some um, uh, assurances about uh, about what our perspective was on the changes to um, uh, to the regulations um, and and what actions um, we would uh, undertake if we ever hit a worst case um, scenario. Have you managed to allay her concerns and the concerns of the others on that particular body? Mm -hmm. uh, well, sh sh she'll have to speak for herself um, there. Um, when I've uh, spoken to her, sh she has had a, a perspective that um, I uh, uh, re respect and, and think is... Um, uh, <coughs> yeah, she, she's made a challenge that I've told her is a, from, from my perspective, is a welcome challenge because it forces people to think very carefully about these issues and not just um, not just brush things under the carpet or or or, um, or, or not even think about them and, and just agree without considering the wider implications. So so I've said that I consider that challenge to be um, helpful and um, useful in forcing people to think about this through a children's rights perspective. But we've made clear that the provisions which now exist, which didn't exist before, um, are not uh, anything that we have any um, desire uh, or even anticipation that we may have to uh, invoke. They were passed as part of the sort of earlier tranches of emergency legislation that exist purely for a worst case scenario. Uh, and when I say worst case scenario, I mean society really struggling to function because so many people um, have um, have got ill. Um, and it looks like that we're not even going to get close to that um, situation now because of the, fa the fact that the virus is not spreading throughout um, the community like it was for a brief period uh, in Jersey and, and the success we've had there. So uh, so ultimately she'll have to speak for um, herself uh, um, w whether she's content with that. Um, sh sh uh, but, but I um, uh, have welcomed her challenge on that and, that and ultimately there's much I agree with her in it. OK, for the avoidance of doubt, can you confirm whether or not you've had to use any of the emergency measures that were discussed and caused concern? Uh, I, I don't think we have, no, um, and, and we're a long way uh, from that, which is uh, which is a good thing and, and I hope we don't get anywhere near it. OK, moving on then. Uh, one of the things that um, was a concern, in fact, I must say I share the concern, is how you're ensuring the children's residential homes are effectively re uh, regulated, because as I understand it, you're not doing any visits to the residential homes, or is that a mistaken belief? Well, the Care Commission have, have suspended their physical inspections uh, on uh, until further notice, um, but they, they have regular contact uh, with the uh, residential children's homes. Um, uh, I don't know if, if Mark wants to add anything to that, but but that that's um, obviously not ideal. Um, and the having the Care Commission uh, and them being able to um, conduct physical inspections is an important thing that um, we would want to uh, have them feel they can recommence as soon as possible, um, but that they are still in contact though. OK, how many? Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Minister. Um, I mean, it, it is the fact that it's the Care Commission that uh, regulates us and they have chosen to stop visiting. So part of that question is for them. Uh, but within that, um, we continue to fulfil our regulator requirements. We have to notify them of any incidences of children going missing 
uh, of any children being ill and staffing levels becoming to a, a critical level, for example. Um, and all of those notifications come via me and ultimately are overseen by Mark Rogers. Um, and that continues. We continue to get um, regular updates and correspondence from the chief inspector and her inspection team in relation to their plans and which 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 homes aren't being visited and why they are continuing to have regular contact with the registered managers. Um, sometimes that's daily and certainly it is weekly. Um, and importantly, the independent person um, who uh, we uh, essentially contract with um, has continued to do remote uh, visits. So he's not physically visiting, but he is holding registered managers and staff to account. And when young people are in the home, he's also speaking to them remotely uh, to gather views. And he is continuing to do his monthly reports, which come to our residential service managers, the registered manager, and a copy goes to the care commission. Well, we're looking at a possibility of what two years before the care. Um, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the body. The the body uh, that is responsible. Yeah, the care commission. Care commission. It's going to be two years before they actually do a physical visit. Is that correct? Uh, the current power uh, that was agreed by uh, assembly members um, is up until September. Uh, and of course, they are reviewing that on a daily and a weekly and a monthly basis. Um, uh, and they are, of course, routine inspections uh, that they have suspended. But if, if, of course, they needed to do an inspection for an emergency reason, um, I'm sure without making uh, uh, taking this away from them, they are able to uh, visit with PPE equipment. So um, I could not foresee a situation where uh, they wouldn't visit for two years, but that's, of course, a matter for them. OK, um, in terms of um, using remote uh, meetings and inspections, in a sense, you'll accept that it's no substitute for actual physical one. And I must say that this is something that does concern me, because when we get into situations like this, a lot of the oversight, the regulation just doesn't exist in a, an effective form because I say we're having a video conference now. I can see you face to face. I can't see what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know if uh, when they're talking to a child that there isn't someone over their shoulder looking. So when do you think we'll get to a point where we can have some physical uh, actual visits? Bearing in mind, obviously, the need for PPE. Uh, Minister, I mean, uh, that is as uh, much driven by health uh, as it is by anybody. Um, and of course, we are going through the stages of our exit strategy as a government. Um, uh, and I would hope that we would start to see some of that um, as soon as possible. Uh, but there is no doubt that um, lots is hidden. Lots of things are hidden by our current circumstances. And we need to work hard to be as transparent as we possibly can without putting both staff, young people and their families at risk of uh, of, of, of a disease that ultimately could kill them. So it's a very fine balancing act. Um, that is not to say uh, that we aren't vigilant to that. And of course, where we can have transparency, we should have. Right, thank you. OK, I just want to ask you one final question. That is, uh, what support are you offering to young people currently who are in residential homes and how are they maintaining contact with their social worker and key support services? And whoever wants to take that up. Sure. Mark. Thank you, Minister. Well, as I have already said uh, in answer to another question, um, interestingly, um, the young people are having more interaction and are developing better relationships with the staff in the home than they have enjoyed previously um, in the main. Um, so um, they are receiving a high level of support by definition of having stronger, more trusted relationships. Um, interestingly, feedback from uh, staff are that um, during the lockdown period where they have been allowed out for two hours, for example, um, the children and young people who usually wouldn't be seen dead with their residential childcare officer have happily um, gone for a bike ride along um, St Ivan's Bay, for example. Um, the um, social workers have been able to um, do um, doorstep visits and garden visits and when appropriate uh, have been able to enter uh, the property. Uh, and uh, we've also been able to continue to facilitate social distancing, physical contacts with their birth families 
um, obviously following the risk assessment that I described earlier, um, and where they've needed to have access to health professionals um, and other staff, then that again has been risk assessed and facilitated accordingly. Um, I am not um, in any uh, receipt of information whereby a young person in our residential care has been denied a service that they've needed as a result of COVID. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay thank you, Mike. Um, I think Deputy Hewing, you've got the first of the general questions that we were talking about. Do you want to lead with that one? And this is very general. Um, I believe the first annual Children's Day is due to be celebrated in early July. Um, what form will that now take, if any? Uh, good question. And uh, who knows at this point, um, because uh, there, there, there had been um, the beginnings of uh, preparations for having something occur on that day. I think we were looking at um, what one aspect would have been a family fun day uh, in uh, one of the parks here. Um, but unfortunately, anything that's going to require, um, well, anything that would have been in the form of a gathering or, or people coming together in that way um, has to be um, reviewed on the basis of the health advice. Um, and I'm not particularly optimistic that we'll be in a, a position at the beginning of July um, to be um, uh, to be recommencing that sort of um, uh, public activity, which is a great shame, not just for this, but for lots of other things as well. Um, so um, it, it, the, the intention is still to mark it in some sort of way, um, but that may mean rather than having the sort of fun aspects of it, m uh, more focus on, on perhaps some um, online learning stuff like we know some of the um, what the, the schools and, and education are uh, are doing at the moment. So it may it may simply be that we have to incorporate something um, through there, but but still with the intention of having uh, it marked and and understood and involved with children uh, in that way, because we do want it to be a a, um, a, a big deal in Jersey uh, in the coming years. Could I just follow up on some a related matter, and that is the idea of the memorial that was planned, which was highly controversial. Can you tell us the current status of that? Uh, the uh, uh, th there was um, uh, the, uh, we had been calling for people to come and uh, offer design concepts uh, to us and that had begun uh, before the pandemic kicked off and and since that has since that has obviously disrupted lots of uh, things we've extended that to enable more opportunities for uh, for people to contribute um, their ideas uh, the, the intention uh, beforehand was to have some sort of public opportunity for people to come and see concepts comment on them and for us to take feedback on that uh, in recognition of the fact that uh, that it's controversial. Um, I, I think that lots of this um, uh, proposal uh, has been misunderstood uh, and that's why I'm keen for there to be some form of public engagement so that it can be, I think, uh, better understood what it means and, and what format it may take. Um, that's obviously difficult to do uh, where where people are restricted in, in where they can go, so there will have to be a, a think about how that can be um, facilitated, but 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 beyond beyond that, and no, I'm not quite able to say just yet. But you are still planning on going ahead with the memorial, are you? Uh, well, that's the intention. It's it's still uh, out open to tender. Um, when that when when the picture is clearer of what that will look like, we'll, we'll engage the public then. But um, the government committed to accepting uh, that legacy recommendation of the care inquiry, um, a citizens panel. Uh, were convened to um, make proposals regarding that um, uh, and uh, I personally think it would be wrong to um, U-turn on that. Um, certainly at this point I think what's right to do is to um, have some form of public engagement for people to understand what it will, uh, what it could look like and contribute um, ideas to it and I think that's a better way of achieving some sort of reconciliation uh, much better uh, then um, simply ploughing ahead without considering people's opinions or U-turning without considering the people on the other side of the argument. Okay, thank you. 
Roland, did you have a question you want to put in there quickly? Yeah, Minister, given it by your own words, and I think it's acknowledged it is controversial, and there's actually some very strong opposition to it for very valid reasons from people who are quite close. Um, wouldn't it just make sense, given we have so many other issues going on at the moment, which are really fundamental to the future of our island and the livelihoods of many, many people, that we just um, you know, just don't give it oxygen for the time being, take it away and review it, defer it and maybe review it in a year or so's time and focus on other other really very, very important issues that we're facing? Well, it, it's still theoretically possible that that could happen, but the, the process was open before the pandemic. Um, uh, uh, hit us. Uh, it has a course to still go through. It's not detracting from any efforts um, anywhere else at this point. Um, we'll see what comes of it and if a future decision needs to be made about how to deal with it best in the circumstance then we'll get to that but, but that decision doesn't need to be made at this point. Why don't you just take the leadership and say we're going to defer it, we understand it's controversial, we want to focus all energies elsewhere on important matters at the moment and then bring it bring it back when the new normal returns. Uh, because I've just said that I don't think it is detracting from any efforts uh, on, on anything um, uh, anywhere uh, and I've also said that um, the next stage of this is not set in stone at this point so it may well come to a point where uh, where it, it's dealt with differently but we're not there yet and it's not detracting from anyone's energy. Uh, there was a, a process uh, beforehand it will, it will require us to sit down and have a think at some point but we're not there yet um, and there'll be more information when we are at that point um, but but I, I don't feel that um, a change is necessary beyond what we've already changed which is extending the um, uh, period for um, uh, uh, tenders. Okay thank you. Um, I've got a few questions which sort of link into that about the impact of COVID-19 on policy priorities. But I'll start with a couple of specifics and then perhaps if you want to answer those and if you want to add any general impacts. Are you progressing as planned bringing forward the legislation for indirect incorporation of the UNCRC? Um, so the, the 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 broad answer to, to all questions about um, about the policy priorities for this year is that um, the uh, office of support for developing that, which had been planned, we had our um, children's legislation transformation program that had our um, our phases and our, our deadlines. Um, all of the people that were doing the work for that um, have been redirected to. Uh, or the response to the pandemic. Um, they, are, they are extremely busy uh, and I unfortunately have very little time with them now because of all the hard work uh, they're doing um, uh, as part of this response. So it is the case that no work is being done on uh, those uh, policy projects that we were uh, planning to work on had we been in normal times uh, and that has meant that um, there, there is inevitably going to be delay to some of these things. Um, in, ter in terms of achieving uh, these outcomes, uh, UNCRC incorporation, um, amendments to the children's law, etc., they are non-negotiable as far as I'm concerned in that they continue to be priorities and will be delivered. Uh, but I, I think it's in I think it's in June that we're due as a council of ministers to have an update on the picture of, of where we are and, and we'll have to make some decisions about um, how how things are timetabled going on uh, after this disruption but but at the moment no work is being done on those things which is uh, a very upsetting situation to be in unfortunately. <coughs> and so we can assume that the you, you, what was referred to as an omnibus amendments to the 2020 children's law won't be happening this year then? Um, at this point. Uh, sorry, at in, this, sorry, in 2020 is what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, um, at, at this point I'm not prepared to rule it out, um, but I will acknowledge that it may well be unlikely. Um, it may well be pushed back um, a few months, but it, it remains high up on my list of priorities because there are changes to that legislation that do need to be made. Um, 
it's it's just not a simple thing to do unfortunately it requires time and attention which hasn't been able to be devoted to it uh, because of the pandemic um but but i will i will endeavor to update the panel as soon as possible on that because you'll probably um uh, have um, some important scrutiny work you want to do on that when uh when it's clearer so, so i'll make sure you're um you're high up on the list of people to be informed when the timetable is a bit clearer good thanks for that um we've got a few minutes left trevor do you want to ask the next question the next general one so we move on a little are you there trevor uh, i don't know if we've lost deputy point and so i'll ask the question um when are you expecting to publish the findings of your joint survey with the children's commissioner and how are you intending to respond to those findings? Um, so the survey is currently being looked at uh, by our um, officers um, and it is already being considered uh, as part of the development of the children's rights impact assessment on um, eventually reopening um, the schools. Um, the Children's Commissioner herself has done some analysis of it um, with with her team uh, and have sent that on to us. Um, I, I've personally not not yet had a, a proper opportunity to go through the analyses that um, that we've been shown. So at this point, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure when the results will be uh, made public. Uh, I do know that an invitation um, has, has hopefully gone out already to um, to yourselves as a panel for us to meet ministers children's commissioner and yourself to go through um some of that but but at this point i'm not sure exactly when the moment is that that will be made public okay uh, i just want to before we finish there was a i think a very important question to ask about the any legislative developments in respect to covid19 are they being adequately addressed to ensure children's rights are taken into account and I ask that because I know that as scrutiny panels, we're trying to pick up pieces of legislation across panels because it is many of the emergency things are crossing panels and we're having quite a job to do that. So how is that in terms of children's rights? Um, so um, we we haven't had the UNCRC incorporation um, procedures implemented in Jersey yet so there isn't a um, compulsory requirement to produce children's rights impacts assessment yet as there will be in the future which will um, make um, that process an inbuilt thing as just something uh, we do so it, it has been the case and, and I think it it is right to admit this that some of the um, legislation development that's happened in the last couple of months has been clumsy at times where some of the communication um, has not been as good um, as it ought to have been, uh, which has meant that there have been issues that um, have potentially been overlooked or, or missed first time round, which has made um, correcting some of it uh, uh, more difficult than we'd have liked it to have been. Um, or, or there, there have also been um, instances where there's just been honest disagreement about the children's rights aspects. Um, you know, often in um, uh, in legal arguments on human rights, there's not necessarily a right answer and a wrong answer. There's legal argument um, one way or the other, and um, and arguments about proportionality uh, uh, in particular can be difficult to settle. Um, so. Uh, uh, it is it is becoming part of the culture in the government that children's rights are at the forefront uh, of our mind but in uh, an unprecedented situation uh, like we're in some of the uh, development of that has been clumsy uh, and there are definitely lessons to learn for the future but when we get that compulsory requirement for children's rights impacts assessment um, it will end up just being something we do and, and that process will hopefully be much improved and uh, how are you ensuring that as we recover from this, um, uh, I'll give you a worst case scenario and perhaps you can deal with that, uh, Minister. Um, uh, if we recover from this with austerity or even austerity on steroids, yeah. it's a well known fact that the poorest and particularly children of the poorest uh, are damaged most by that sort of policy. So how are you going to try to ensure that that doesn't happen 
and that, that, that young people and children are protected as we come out of this um, pandemic. Um, I think the philosophy that, that I've taken um, since becoming minister has been that um, uh, doing the right thing um, for children is what you must do uh, and cost or affordability um, are something you think of completely separately to that uh, and I um, do not like the argument um, that it has existed as a fundamental part of political discourse for the last decade um, that uh, constant um, efficiency savings or austerity uh, is somehow a path towards prosperity because I think that the um, economic evidence is that that is a complete load of nonsense and what actually improves your society uh, is investment. You've just got to be clever about how you invest in it and how you um, then benefit from the returns you get from it. Um, and what we have demonstrated in children's services uh, is that uh, if you uh, invest in particular things like early help, uh, like the um, uh, intensive fostering um, uh, service that we're developing, um, which requires upfront money to do that, eventually it just provides natural savings because you're providing um, better support for people in the early days and you will then avoid some of the more expensive scenarios that you can encounter where you have to send people off island um, uh, or um, or, or take um, harsher safeguarding measures because you didn't deal with something earlier. Uh, so what my political view is that austerity is a false economy. Uh, and when we resume discussions about recovery and about the next stage of the government plan, um, I've said both publicly and, and privately, uh, I, th I think the word I've used is fools. I think we'd be fools if we attempted to do what we've done in the past and expect a different outcome. And our commitment to maintaining the investments in children's services uh, cannot be shaken at all by this crisis. If anything, it demonstrates that it's even more important. Thank you very much. We, I'm conscious of time. Is there anything that anyone else on the panel wants to ask uh, before we finish? I will take silence as a no. Is there anything, Minister, that you want to add or any of your officers want to add or ask of the panel before we finish? Um, no, just to, just to thank you for the work that you're doing. I know um, there's a lot, a lot of pressure when there's um, relatively short notice for legislation uh, that has to be scrutinised. Um, and I, I think that your panel in particular is regarded as having done a, a very good job on that. Um, and uh, the place you're coming from in, in your um, commitment and understanding to children's rights is, is uh, 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 leads to very welcome uh, contributions. So thank you for everything that you're doing as well. Thank you. Uh, and I actually want to embarrass our scrutiny officers and say a public thank you to Andy and Monique who work so hard behind the scenes that you don't see and, and, and absolutely do that type of work. So thank you to them. And with that, Thank you, Dr. Hewling. And with that, uh, I'll call the hearing to an end and say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.